that you have requested. This I declare to you, say the Lord. Amen. Amen. Just give the Lord a praise off you if you would. And while you're still here, while you're still standing, uh, we had a request come in from Bangkok, Thailand. And you're over here this time. <laughs> Harlan, you and Jolene, you left Cagayan de Oro in the Philippines, and you set out to plant a church in Bangkok, Thailand. And then Nancy and I have planted many churches, as we know that it's not an easy task. And you have asked for prayer. So Harlan, right now, as you're watching, I want to reach out to you and agree in prayer with you for your church in Bangkok to grow. And I don't know what the makeup of the church is. I know there's probably a lot of precious Filipinos there. There's so many of them work in that area, Hong Kong, Bangkok, all throughout that area. But I want you to reach more than just, just the Filipinos. I want you to reach out to every culture that is in your area because I know they come from all around the world and work there. And God will open a door for you if you'll be bold enough to declare the fullness of God's glory and His power and not shirk nor pull back. I've known you for many years. I've known you and Jolene when you first started. And I know what God is going to do in you. You're like a son to me. And I know that God is going to open the windows of heaven. So, Father, right now for this church in Bangkok, Thailand, Lord, for Harlan and Jolie, Lord, we lift up, up in the name of Jesus right now. We encourage them in the name of Jesus right now. And we tell them to be bold, to be brave, to be strong, to be fearless, and to move forward in the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. Not to listen to what the naysayers would say or look at circumstances around them. But Father, we pray for them and we pray for their church right now. God, lift them up. God, strengthen them. God, supply every need that they have according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if there's other of you watching from different parts of around the Lake area or around the United States or overseas, we pray for you, we lift you up, we encourage you, we love you, and we want you to know that today is a day you can receive a miracle. We serve a supernatural God, and we're going to learn how to walk in the supernatural, natural, amen, and it's just a part of who we are, the supernatural power and the manifestations of God. So we love you, and thank you for being with us this morning, amen. Another one right now. Casey, I know you've been battling a lot of different situations, spots on your lungs, and then just your kidney areas, all kinds of things. I believe the report of the Lord. Everybody's going to say it together. We believe the report of the Lord, and the report of the Lord says you're healed from the top of your head to the sole of your feet right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, Casey, give the Lord a praise offering. Casey was with us on a couple of mission trips to the Philippines. She's my niece, and I love you, precious. You know the power of God. You saw it made manifest. So just give God the glory for it. You are the heel of the Lord in Jesus' name. And let's give our Lord another praise offering. Hallelujah.
It's good to have each of you here with us this morning. Um, today we're going to we're going to talk to you a little bit about miracles. Uh, and I'm going to maybe approach this just a little bit differently this morning. Um, there are so many things when it comes to believing in miracles. Uh, someone asked me one time. How can you feel so confident that God is indeed going to do a miracle? A lot of times there's been a, people have been prayed for, and we hear a lot of different things. We hear like, well, uh, they were healed because they had great faith. Uh, then we hear things like, well, they weren't healed because they had no faith. Um... Uh, I remember uh, years ago when we had, um, from John G. Lake Ministry, Nancy, what was his last name? Curry Blake. Curry Blake. Uh, Curry Blake was here. We had a tremendous, tremendous revival during that time. Healing. And he had a, he had a theory, and I thought it was, yeah, it was a good theory, but boy, it was kind of like right, right in your face. Because he says, the Bible says, the effectual prayer of the righteous man availeth much. So if someone says they don't have enough faith to have prayer, well, what if they don't? You should. <laughs> All right? If your prayers are so effectual and fervent uh, that you should be able to have faith and stand in the gap for them. So a lot of different thoughts about uh, miracles and what God does. And, and I'm just going to share with you what I know. And the first part of what I'm going to share this morning you, what I know, is from my own life, my experiences growing up and, and early in, in our ministry. And then the second part, I'm going to share with you from the Word of God. First part is, uh, here a few weeks back, uh, I was at my brother's house, Mark, and uh, <clears throat> Mark handed me some papers. And when I looked at these papers, these were papers that my mother had written about her life. And uh, before she passed, she wanted all of us kids to have a story of, of her life and my, my dad's life growing up. And on one of the pages that was given to me uh, was my story, okay, um, long before I you know, came into this world. Uh, and it was a story about uh, her pregnancy while she was carrying me. She was just a little over 16 years old. She had already had one child. Uh, and um, she would go on and there'd be seven of us kids all together. And um, all that she went through, and even to the point to where she was literally told by my grandmother, my dad's mother, do not go to the hospital, have the child at home. Uh, it's too much money. You can't afford a hospital. Stay home, have the baby at home, okay? Now realize she had one child and he almost died uh, having birth. And my mother said, basically, no, I don't care what it costs, I'm going to go to the hospital. Come to find out, had she not went to the hospital, uh, I probably would not be here today because of all the complications that arose. So see, I came into this world a miracle. All right? I came into this world by uh, the hand of God. And that was the reason that I have my name, Paul Michael, because she, she wanted me to be like the Apostle Paul, but she knew that I was an angel like Gabriel. <laughs> <laughs> I met the archangels, all right? So I ended up being called Paul Michael, all right? So uh, growing up, I used the name Michael because I was always such an angel. Uh, <laughs> But later on that changed, obviously, okay? Uh, but uh, anyhow, that, that was a miracle. And then uh, the story of when her and my dad was uh, leaving Arkansas uh, and going uh, to St. Louis to work. And, and when they left uh, Arkansas to go to St. Louis to work, uh, they had an old Model T. Uh, was, I think it was a Packard, what it really was. An old Packard, a 36 Packard. You know, the... Bubba had to put about five feet, uh, you know, way out there, a huge, huge car, and it broke down, 
and there was no money. My mother had a nickel, and um, I broke down. My dad had to hitchhike back to Paragol, Arkansas, to get some parts to come back and fix the car. Uh, my mother didn't want to hitchhike because I was only a few months old, and there was no food. There was nothing there. She was just on the side of the road. And how a family uh, picked her and told her to come into their house where I got to have some milk and you know, things like, of that nature. So it was another event in my life that God used supernaturally to provide for me. And then years, a few years later, I was in Arkansas visiting my grandparents and got deathly ill. And when uh, they took me to the doctor at that time, they had an iron lung waiting for me in St. Louis because they knew that I had contacted polio and that the doctor told my parents I would live in an iron lung the rest of my life. Now, some of you are young you don't know what an iron lung is. An iron lung is just a big tube, and your whole body is on the inside of the tube, and your head is out, and you're able to look at yourself in a mirror, and it kept pressure on your lungs to where you were able to breathe, and you would live your whole life in that iron lung. Lung. And they had it ready for me, but my family prayed and they, they sought God. Um, I still ended up quite sick with scar fever, but it was another miracle that God did for me uh, in my life. Another miracle that God did for me, I had a little white bunny rabbit. And uh, this was when the age of ice boxes, when they, when they closed, they latched, you know. And if you're on the inside, you don't get out. And this little bunny rabbit jumped into the uh, icebox. It was in a basement of a friend's house with my parents. I went in after it. It went out, and the door shut, and I'm locked in the basement. And I can't get out. And uh, obviously, the breath, you know, was little by little, the uh, air was going away. And I remember screaming and crying. And my mom said, I don't know what happened. I just looked around and I said, Where, where's Michael? And uh, she had no idea I was locked in a refrigerator in the basement. And all of a sudden, the next thing I know, the door opens and, and I, I'm almost blue, my mother said, and they were able to resuscitate me and another miracle in the life. And I can go on and go on quite a bit about situations I would get into to where knives pulled on me and guns, uh, you know, at my head and all kinds of things. But through all of that, God supernaturally provided a miracle. Uh, my, my dad was crippling arthritis. They said at 28 he would never get out of bed. He'd be crippled all of his life. Three days after they diagnosed him with that, he said, I'll stand at the window in three days and give praise to God. My father died in his uh, late 60s uh, and never was of arthritis. <laughs> God healed him. I watched my mother go through seven bouts of cancer, and every time God healed her of the cancer. My sister had a rare blood disease. She was the only girl that had lived in a tri-state area with this particular disease. They said she'd never outgrow it. She outgrew it. And uh, Sharon's getting ready to turn, what, 60? Or her? 63. 63, okay. 63. Well, obviously, she outgrew it, okay? Why am I saying all of this? One of the reasons that I really believe in miracles is because I've seen a whole life of miracles. I've seen God move in so many situations that for me to be standing here is a miracle. Because all through my life, there have been so many points of death that could have come and the enemy could have taken me out. But I know that God had a purpose for my life. I know God had a reason for me. You, everyone in this room, you're part of that reason. Those that we went to around the world is part of that reason. My wife sitting here is part of that reason. My children, my grandchildren... Everything in our life, God has an eternal purpose for us and a plan for us. Now, the enemy doesn't want you to fulfill that plan. 
He wants you to be totally, completely incapacitated, totally put down and destroyed. Why? Because in your life, you hold life. And that life is through Jesus Christ. And you can change people's lives. Just like the girls this week at, at camp. Some of their little refugee kids, their lives will have been turned upside down this week. And though you girls may not get to ever see them again, for those little kids, you will live forever in your life. <laughs> you made an impact in their life. You changed them. And you're, you know, society would look at you and say, now that you're, you're 13 years old, you're 14 years old, you're 12, whatever your age is, what can you do? You provided a miracle for Amen. those kids. Amen. You changed those kids' lives. That's the power of a miracle. So, when people say, Brother Paul, do you really believe in miracles? Oh, yes, I do. I can tell you stories when we was doing chaplain work at Parkland. I can tell you stories for hours of miracles where everybody said, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way. And yet the patient would end up walking out of the hospital totally, completely healed by the power of God. We've seen miracles in this room alone. Uh, when you look at Tammy's little granddaughter, where, where the doctors kept saying, this child needs to be aborted. This child needs to be aborted. This child's never going to live. This child ain't even going to have a brain. When, when a, a, you know, the physical part of the brain ain't even going to be there when she's born. And she's as cute as a little child, her smart as a little girl running around church. Uh, God totally, completely healed her. It was a miracle. Well, that was a healing. No, that's not a healing. That's a miracle. <laughs> All right. You understand what I'm saying? That was a miracle. All right? Because that defied every natural element. They were confirmed with it. That's when they say there is no way. We're just going to let her lie here and it'll all grow back. No, that's not what they said. It took a supernatural plan of God to supernaturally create what the body had not created. So that's what a miracle is. A miracle is when everything in front of me says, no way possible. There's no uh, scientific way that this can happen and take place. And God says, I made the law. I created the law. I created the universe. I created the body, and I'm going to make a change in that body right now. And I'm going to say blindness be healed, death be healed, kidneys be replaced, and every manner of miracle that might be needed. God says, I'm going to supersede the law. Hey, and if He gave the law, and He created everything, don't you think He has the right and the power to supersede that law? Surely He does. So He supersedes that law and does what man cannot explain God does it. So what do I believe in? Well, I believe in the Word of God. I believe that what God's Word says, He means. And I believe that all I've learned to do over all my years is simply stand on the Word of God, trust the Word of God, and not lean to my own understanding. Okay? Proverbs says, lean not unto your own understanding, but acknowledge God in all of His ways. Alright? That is the greatest key for you to receive a miracle in your life. Because most of the time, if we're not receiving a miracle, it's because we're trying to lean on our own understanding. We're trying to figure out how God's going to do it, okay? And I don't care if it's a physical need or a financial need. You need a miracle, quit leaning on how you think it's going to come to pass. Well, I think I'm going to have a financial miracle because I'm going to win the lottery. Nah, you probably ain't going to win the lottery, all right? All right, the only ones that win the lottery are the ones that don't need the money. It's kind of like going to the bank, okay? You know, well, you ain't got enough collateral for me to give you a loan. Well, if I had collateral, I wouldn't come here to get a loan, okay? So don't lean to your own understanding of how God's going to do it. Amen. Just believe the Word of God that God says, I will do it. Because if we'll believe His Word and stand on His Word, and not our own understanding. Alright? 
people ask me a lot of times, well, how come we saw a lot of miracles years ago and we don't see as many today as we should? You know, years ago we didn't have all the options that we have. Years ago, there wasn't things like welfare. There wasn't things like Medicare. There wasn't all of the things that are available to us. And many times, people just simply had to learn how to live and trust God on the Word. Now, I'm not against any of the, the medicine. I'm not against doctors. I'm not against any of that. I thank God for all of their ability. But I know someone who has more power than the surgeon has, and that's the power of the Word of God. I want to learn how to stand on God's Word. I want you and I to learn how to stand on God's Word for whatever the needs are in our individual life. And I believe if we'll do that, God will change us and make differences in our life. So, I want to turn, if you would, just for a moment to Hebrews chapter 4. And we're going to spend a little bit of time in the book of Genesis in a moment. And I'm going to kind of lay a groundwork for you. Okay, in Genesis, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 4, 2, verse number 4. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4. God also testifying with them, both in signs and wonders, and by various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to His own will. Now the scripture tells us that God is the one who will confirm signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, when I look at faith healers, I have no problem with faith healers if they're really real and they're not doing it on their own because a faith healer, if he really is uh, gifted with healing in his life, the gift of healing, then he's going to do what? He's going to give all the honor and glory unto God. He's not going to seek any glory or honor unto himself because at the end of the day, he realizes that it's God that does the healing. But he speaks the power of the Word of God in a meeting like this or in a crusade. He speaks the power of God's Word and God says, because you have spoken my Word, I want to confirm my Word and I will confirm it through demonstration of signs and wonders and miracles and healings. So, our responsibility is to minister the Word of God and then allow God to back up what we say. So now if I don't minister the Word of God to healing for you in your life, and if you haven't come to a place where you can believe the Word of God for healing, then the odds are the signs and the miracles and wonders aren't going to take place in your life because your faith isn't to that point to trust Him for that. And then also in your own individual life, the Word of God hasn't been shared to you. So this is why I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles because I know that if I share God's Word with you about miracles and them being able to happen in your life and take place in your life and change your life and I can feed the Word of God to you enough, I know that Somewhere in that process, you're going to begin to believe God's Word. And God says, because you believe my Word, now I am mandated by my own Word to perform that which I have declared unto you. Amen? Amen. Amen. So now, I, you have... I, I don't want to necessarily phrase it this way, but I am going to anyhow. <laughs> Alright? It's not like we put God in a box. But what we're basically doing because of the Word now, and we stand on the Word, we declare the Word, we speak the Word, we believe the Word, and we put the Word back unto God, now God comes up with Jeremiah, and He has to say, I love to perform the words of my mouth. Because now we have put it back to God, and say, God, this is what You have said, this is what your word says. I'm believing it. I've got it now, not up only here in my brain. It's in my heart and in my spirit. And you stand on that word. And when you stand on that word, God says, okay, you've got me here now. I will perform that because that is according to my word. Amen. And God cannot do something that is not in accordance with his word. But he must do now, not because I said so, 
but he must do what he has confirmed in his word because he said, I cannot lie, nor can I break a promise. Well, if you can't break a, a promise and you can't lie, and you said that you are the God that healeth us, now if I believe you are the God that healeth us, and you can't lie, you can't break your promises, then what's going to happen? God is going to heal us and touch us because it's His Word. Hallelujah to God. Now that's true in our natural healing. It's true in our finances. It's true in our spiritual walk. It's true in relationships. It's true in every area of our lives. And we've got to come to that point and that understanding. Now I mentioned to you recently that we are Christians. And the God that we serve is not a Christian God. He is the Savior of the world. See, every faith has their own God. But our God is not just a God exclusively unto us, but our God is what? He's the Savior of the entire world. And one, oh hallelujah, you've got to get a hold of this because I want you to know who you're serving. Amen. See, every other God, they're either dead and in the grave or they're long forgotten about. But our God, the God of the universe, the Savior of the world, says that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that I am God. I'm the Savior of the world. No one else claims to be the Savior of the world except Jesus Christ. And we go through the book of John. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the Alpha and the Omega, first and the last. I am the door. I am the vine. I am the only way into the presence of my Father. Yes. Jesus says, I am more than anybody. Yes. Because He wants you to know He is. Amen. <laughs> Put it in a southern vernacular, He is that He is. And that's all that he is. Woo. He's everything for us. But you've got to believe that. Because if you do, we're a God of miracles. Christianity is all based on miracles. Everything we do is, is based on a, on a miracle that God has done. So I want to look for a moment. If we go back to Genesis, and you'll just have to kind of follow me through with Genesis and maybe read it all for a little bit later. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. What happened? In the beginning, God did what? He created. What did He create? The heavens and the earth. If I'm asking you a question this morning, and let me put it through this way. If God created the heavens and the earth, would you call that a miracle? Yes. I mean, there was nothing here. All right? Zero. There was no substances or particles to, to put things together to form uh, trees and mountains and so forth. God says, let there be. And Scripture says that everything that is was created by God, through God, for Him. And in Christ, everything is held together. Now, wouldn't you call that a miracle? Yes. Everything is held together. So Scott, that means that if Christ wasn't in the picture, and Christ wasn't doing a supernatural miracle, 20, oh hallelujah, I want you to get a hold of this. If he wasn't doing a supernatural miracle 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, how old are you? Old enough. Old enough. <laughs> All right. You're supposed to give me a year. 56. 54. I'm close. All right. If he hadn't been doing that, you would have been a blob on the floor. Because God says, I, all things are being held together. 
How many of you went to high school and you, you learned all about the neutrons and the protons and all the little atoms and everything floating around? You did? All the little things floating around? And they tell you that that's all that you are, are just a bunch of little neutrons and protons floating around and they're not attached and everything. Scripture says, you know what's holding all them things together? Jesus. He's holding it all together. You are held together. So when someone comes to me and says, I'm falling to pieces. No, you're not falling to pieces, all right? God is holding you together. God has cemented you together. Why? Because he's a God of miracles. And that's a miracle that you're cemented together. And if he is cementing you together, guess what? That's the best glue in the whole world. And you're not better than Gorilla Glue. All right, you're not going to fall apart. All right, go tell me I'm, I'm going to fall apart at this. I'm going to say, no, you're not going to fall apart. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get angry. You might get mad, but you're not going to fall apart. So in Genesis 1, we start off, and everything has started off with a miracle. And then we go a little bit further in chapter number 2, that the story of creation in the world and man at the center of it it's a creation. It's a miracle. Now I'm going to make you and I'm going to breathe breath into you. I'm going to breathe life into you. And you know what I'm going to do? Out of this vast creation that I've made, all the animals and everything that I've created, I'm going to give them unto you. You now have dominion. Now, we're getting ready to go into the wild tomorrow. <laughs> all right? You know what I see as a miracle? I see a miracle when God told Adam, name every animal there is and give them a name. I see that as a miracle. I mean, can you imagine a giraffe walking up to him and he says, you're an elephant. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how he came up with all the names. There's a miracle. Why? Everything about us as believers, as Christians, and the Word of God is all based on miracles. Yes. We are a miracle people. We are created by a miraculous God in a miraculous fashion, put in a miraculous universe, given, held together by a miraculous power of God. Why can't we believe in miracles? What keeps us from believing in a miracle? In our lives. We are the we're what keeps us from believing in a miracle. Amen. Well, I just don't think that I deserve a miracle. Why are you talking about? No, I won't receive that. I'm not worthy of a miracle. Do you know what you're telling me? You're telling me that you're not worthy of the blood of Jesus Christ, that by His stripes you are healed. You're telling me that what He did on the cross for you and I wasn't good enough. I'm telling you what He did on the cross was more than good enough to provide a miracle for you. His blood was more than powerful enough to provide a miracle for you. So don't say that you're not worthy enough. You were worthy enough for Him to die for you. Don't you think you're worthy enough for Him to touch you in your body, heal your body, change your body, change your life. You're that worthy. Yeah, well, yeah, but you don't know everything that I've done. I don't need to. God did. He knew you before you was ever born. He knew when you got 18 you were going to do some stupid stuff. Did it please Him? No. But He gave you free choice. And he still said, you know what? Whenever I get ready to go down there and die, I'm going to die for you. And I'm going to die for all the dumb stuff you did. Because I determined before you came into the world that you were worthy of my death. And if he had determined that you were worthy of his death before you came into the world, then don't you think he determined that you were worthy of his healing? And that you were worthy of a miracle in your life? I declare to you that you are. Wow, that's only chapter 3. 
chapter 3. That's where the devil comes into Adam and Eve and, and tempts them to sin. And God has to expel them from the garden. Aren't these miraculous things? I mean, the devil turned into a serpent. And he deceived them. Listen, I know a lot of people who probably, well, I ain't going to go there, but who have issues in their life. But it's about the first time I see something walk in the garden and turn themselves into a serpent and then begins to talk to you in the way that you understand them, that was a miraculous event. That was supernatural. Now, maybe not on the good side, but it was still supernatural. Do you understand where I'm trying to help you get to today? To believe that, that miracles and the supernatural happening in each of our lives because we are a people of the supernatural? Wow. Chapter 5, he gives us a genealogy. And then all of a sudden in chapter 6, there's a great flood that comes. And the Bible says that the firmaments of the heavens opened and the bowels of the earth opened. Water came up out of the inner parts of the earth. It came down out of the heavens and the entire face of the earth was covered with water. How many of you would say that was a miracle? Sure it was. That don't know just happened. But all of a sudden now, everything is covered with water. And out of all of that, there were a few people who believed upon the Lord and went into the ark and they found safety. Wasn't that a miracle? When everybody else rejected God, when, when, when a whole entire group of people Everyone except Noah, his wife, and his, his children and their spouses believed upon him. Wasn't that a miracle? It was a miracle. Because you're here today because of that. You and I worship God today because Noah obeyed God, his family was saved, and because of that, when they came out of the ark, they made an altar, they sacrificed unto the Lord, and ultimately, God's people came from there, and after God's people came from there, we know through history, ultimately, it came to Cornelius' house, the message of salvation, and then the uttermost parts of the earth, and all the way to here, to Kent, Texas. Wow, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. Whew. About the Tower of Babel. Everybody speaks one language. And they were mad because of the flood. They were aggravated. Now, Nimrod says, I'll never let a flood destroy us again. We are powerful. We have one mind and one accord, and we're going to build a tower all the way higher than any of the highest mountains. We're going to build it all the way up into the heavens, and we'll never be touched by flood again. And do you know the power of that? Now, here's the miracle. The miracle is what God says. God says, let us go down there and confuse and confound their language and split it up and make them speak different kind of tongues because whatever they set their mind to do, they will do it. Now that's God's word, not mine. He said they are so united that they will build a tower. Now however high it got, I don't know. But they will build a tower because they've got a mind to do it. Now that's a miracle. You mean a miracle to build a tower? No! A miracle that everybody's mind got on the same page at the same time. That's the miracle. Wow! They were going to build a tower all the way into the heavens because they, one language, one mind. Why do you think we have the power of the Holy Spirit? 
Because there is a language that transcends our natural verbal language, and that's the language of the Holy Spirit. Because when we're all together united in the power of the Holy Spirit, we speak one language, we speak God's language, amen, and we see God's miracles taking place. Because we're not at each other with different languages. I believe that's one of the reasons the Holy Spirit was made manifest through tongues because it was God's way of saying, I used tongues to confuse you at one time, but now I'm going to use them to unite you yes. now to do the work at the end time. Yes. I believe that. My time is running short. The Tower of Babel. So really the first 11 chapters of Genesis don't actually fit theory of man but what they do do is they let us know that our whole con our whole conception by God was miracle. One miracle right after the other. If God started us that way, if everything in His plan was miraculous, then why would we come to a point in our life to where we say, God, I know how you started this out, but we don't need that anymore. We've got it covered from here on. And isn't that what we've really said? Oh, I believe in creation. I believe in the Bible stories. I believe in the flood. I, I, I believe in the Tower of Babel. I believe in Jonah and the whale. And I, I believe in Isaiah. And I, I believe in the miracles that Jesus did. But God, from this point on, even though you've done miracles for 4,000 years, from this point on, or 6,000, from this point on, we got it covered. We can take care of it. We can do it ourselves. And you know what? We have failed miserably. More Christians are depressed. Yeah. Divorce rate in the church is as high as it is in the world. Yeah. People, Christians, are, are beaten down physically. They're beaten down in their body. They're tired. They're depressed. They, they feel like they're, they're, they can't overcome anything in their life. I don't think we've done a very good job. I think we need to go back to the beginning and say, God, we started like miracles. We're going to stand in miracles. We're going to believe in miracles. And we're going to walk in miracles. I could go on. It was a miraculous call of Abraham. Now, I'm not even getting out of the book of Genesis this morning. It was a miraculous call of Abraham. How many of you do believe that it was a miracle when Abraham took Isaac upon the mountaintop? Abraham, kill your firstborn son. But God, you promised him. I waited 99 years for him. <laughs> kill him. Make a sacrifice of him. But God, Sarah said she ain't going to go through this again. <laughs> Not in a hundred. <laughs> so he takes Isaac up. Dad, where's the sacrifice? Well, he wasn't going to tell him it was him. He said, God will provide. Amen. See, his faith was in God. His faith, listen to me, his faith was in the spoken word of God. God said, he will make a way. Amen. He promised me a son, and God will not lie. Even though he's asking me to sacrifice you, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. But God will be true to his word and God will provide. Yes. And then they hear the ram caught in the thicket, in a bush, a mesquite tree. All right? And they take that lamb and they offer it unto the Lord. Just the time the knife was going up in the air, getting ready to come down. Now, wouldn't you say that was a miracle? Yes. Oh, yeah. Now, there's a little bit of story a little bit later on about one of the sons of Isaac. His name is Jacob. And Jacob is going to be with God. 
and Jacob uh, uh, is traveling and, and he's running away from his brother because his brother, uh, they didn't have the best of relationships, okay? So he's running away from his brother. He's afraid his brother's going to catch him. He's afraid that when his brother catches him, he'll beat him up, maybe even do worse than that. But he falls asleep and while he's asleep and he's got his head on a, on a stone for a pillow and while they're sleeping there, all of a sudden the heavens opened up and there's a ladder. And on that ladder are angels. And those angels are going up and down and up and down that ladder. Now, wouldn't you call that a miracle? There it is. And Jacob wrestles with God. Now, can you imagine... The creator of the universe? And now you are in a position that you're going to wrestle with him? No. Ain't none of them guys on WWE would even take up that challenge. <laughs> and no way! To wrestle with God? No, no. But he wrestles with him. And God says, I'm going to let you always remember this night. Jacob goes like, I'm going to wrestle with you and I'm going to prevail. I'm going to prevail. I'm not going to lose. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to be there. And God says, okay, you win. But here I'm going to leave you with something. That smacks him in his hip. And the rest of his life he remembers that night with God. That's right. But here's what he does. A miracle. First of all, it's a miracle. Now, Jacob wasn't a Christian critter. <laughs> a miracle, God didn't just finish it with him. But God had a plan. Because God says, I'm going to raise up a people unto myself, and they will be known as the sons of God, and I will be known as their father, and I'm going to take you, Jacob, and now that you and I have wrestled, and you have contended with me, I want you to realize no longer are you called Jacob, but from this moment on, you are called Israel, and you are going to be my people. Oh, hallelujah to God. I don't care what your political motivation is about Israel. I could really don't care. But what I do know is what God said. God said, you will always be my people. And with my covenant, I will never forget the covenant that I've made with you. I promise you this land for eternity, for all generations forever to come. That is God's plan for Israel, irregardless of what man's plan seems to be. Listen, we all believe in miracles of our faith. Why then should it be so difficult for us to believe that God can heal cancers, God can shrink up tumors, Jojo Valesco from California. If you're ever watching this on YouTube or something, love you, precious. Took her over to the Philippines one day or on a trip. And she comes back to me and she says, Pastor, I'm in a dilemma. I said, what's the dilemma? She said, I'm praying for this person and I hear that God, God telling me to slap them. What do I do? Make sure you heard God. <laughs> Make sure you heard God. She slapped him. I don't know if she was waiting to get slapped back or not. But she slapped him. And a deaf ear popped open immediately. Then she'd come back and she asked me again. The Lord told me to do this. So what was it, God? Well, see, she's asking me if it was God. She don't need to be asking me if it's God. She needs to be asking God if it's God. Lord, is this really you? But she would do different physical things like that. 
and they were all being healed. Now, what was that about? Maybe it was just about, are you willing to hear me? And are you willing to do what I'm asking you to do? Because if you are, I'm willing to show up. But I kept telling her, I said, always ask God. Brother Skip, do you remember years ago when uh, W.B. Sr. and some of the others, someone would have a huge tumor in their stomach? I've seen it, yeah. You've seen it? Yeah. They'd come up to be prayed and they'd just go, pop them right there in the belly. Should and you could just, you just watch it go down, be gone, dissolve. We put our hands on goiters that literally stuck out like this on their necks. And we just watch the order just dissolve right at our very fingertips. Deaf ears open, blind eyes are open. Miracle after miracle. See, God has never stopped being the God of the miraculous. That's right. We've just stopped expecting Him That's to be right. the yes. God of the miraculous. That's right. We've stopped believing and expecting. He's the same. He said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever, and there's no variableness or shadow of turning with me. I'm God. Why can't we believe in God for miracles today? Why won't we trust Him for miracles today? You see all manner of sickness and diseases healed. I've shared with you before, back in the 50s, in the healing, healing revivals that were going on, hospitals, they had terminally ill patients, and they knew they were dying of hope. There was a healer, a faith healer in the area, in the tent, they say put them in the ambulance and take them down to the healing meetings where they could get healed. Wouldn't that be awesome today if all of our physicians realize there's nothing else we can do? You know what our options are today? Well, if there's nothing else we can do, go ahead and pull the plug. Listen, I'm just being honest with you. Take them off life support and let them go on home. Not knowing which home they're going to go to. But see, then, they said there's no hope. Send them down to the preacher. <laughs> Send them down to the tent. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could get back to that point and even beyond that point where we believed in miracles and all of a sudden we have intercessory prayer on Monday morning and it goes all day and all night because the line outside is so long because people are coming to be healed and set free and delivered because they know that the miracle working power of God is still here. Yes. Yes. Our first and third Friday nights when we have praise and worship or worship mostly in the healing room that Jeff and Martha have got a line all the way back to this church waiting to get over there on that corner. Or how about better yet, that we believe in God so much and we believe in the power of God so much that people know that all I've got to do is go walk in the front door and I'm going to be healed. Yeah. I know I can, if I can just get to the door, there's so much power and belief in the miraculous there that I know that God is going to heal me right then and right there. Yeah. When I was a boy, we'd go to a, a general assembly and Friday night was the healing night. People coming from all over the United States, all over the world, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 people. And on Friday night, the line were out the tabernacle door, down the block, around the corner. I mean, it was forever. And there'd be usually about a couple hundred preachers up there, and they'd have a prayer line on one side and the other side, and they'd just start walking through. And as they walked through, canes would fly out, wheelchairs were left to the side, people walked in, dancing, bent over, come out straight, cancers healed, every manner of miracle in the world. They called it the Great Healing Night. Why? People believed that all they had to do was get into the what? Have a preacher pray for them? No. Get into the presence of God. That's all. We create the presence of God through our praise and our worship, through our sacrifice, through ministering the Word of God, and that presence is created. And when you walk into the presence of God, if there's anything wrong with you, you declare healing in the name of Jesus and be healed in Jesus' name. And receive that miracle for your life. And then walk in it. Well, next week we're going to talk about how to keep your healing. Why? Because today you're going to get healed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
the day you're going to receive your miracle. Yes. And they're going to sing that same song we ended with a little while ago on miracles. And whatever your need is this morning, I want you to believe God for it. Rosa, I'm going to call you out, girl. I know everything the doctors have said, but I want you today to believe in your Rick, put all of your thinking aside. Matter of fact, put your hand on your head. I said, this is my thinking, Rick. Say it. This is my thinking. I think you. Rick, I take it all. I put it to the side. All the things that the enemy has told me. All the battles you have. Position against you, even in the government levels, all the things that have been there, every hindrance, we're going to take authority over in Jesus' name right now. We're praying for both of your sons who are in the Ukraine studying. And we know that God's going to bless them and bring them back home, and they're going to add an impact to the ministry. They're a part of it. And we're lifting you up right now. We're going to pray for you and Jesse in Jesus' name. Harlan, Jolie, we're still praying for you too. Those else that are, are watching us, would you stand with me right now? You said, I have come this morning for a miracle. I am believing God today for a miracle. You know what that miracle is that you have need of. I don't care what it might be. You believe God for it. You trust God for it. You've been diagnosed with cancer. Cancer is a name. It's called cancer. C A N C E R. Cancer. And I serve a name that is above every name. And that at that name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And I command that cancer bow to the name of Jesus this morning. Heart disease will bow to the name of Jesus this morning. Inflamed lungs, uh, intestinal problems will bow to the name of Jesus. Heart disease will bow to the name of Jesus this morning. For they're all names and they're all subject unto the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we decree by the word of God today that you are healed by the power of Jesus Christ. Whether you're in this sanctuary on the other side of the world, God has healed you in Jesus' glorious name. I don't care what it is. Believe in a miracle today. Receive a miracle today. God wants you to receive it. But I don't really know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Then receive the greatest miracle that man could ever know and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. That's the greatest miracle any of us will ever achieve. Oh, but I've got so much stuff in my life. Believe God for a miracle. God can erase it in a matter of a nanosecond. It will be erased and gone. You can have power and victory in your life. You need a miracle? Raise your hand unto the Lord and say, I need a miracle, wherever you might be. 
whatever that miracle is, raise your hand and say, I need a miracle. Rick, don't think. You need a miracle? You already got it? And we're going to declare it. Hey Amen. Jeff, don't go nowhere. Be ready. Hey Amen. You need a miracle? Hands are being raised right now. Right now. I want you to simply say, Father God, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom I have received as my Lord and Savior, I receive my miracle. I receive my miracle.
And the Lord said, pull down your healing. You know what to do. So she did, and she, she was instantly healed. So last night, in the middle of the night, I had this terrific hip pain. And I, the first thing I thought was, oh no, I'm not going to have a hip replacement. <laughs> so, so I was reminded. So I said, Lord, I'm going to do your thing. I pulled down the healing for this hip. It was perfectly normal this morning when I got it. Amen. You can lay you you can lay in the sick bed all day, or you can pull down your healing and get up and get out. <laughs> all right, God's doing some awesome stuff this morning. You're here for the first time. Thank you so much for being with us. We know you have a choice, um, and you decided to spend it with us. And for that, we're on. And we'd love for you to meet uh, my wife. She'll be in the uh, prayer room, and she'll have a gift for you. And uh, we're just going to bless the Lord this morning and everything that he's doing. Amen. Before we move into a little bit more, I just want to make a few announcements. Uh, if you're a young man and you want to work and you can work out of town, uh, you have a driver's license. Uh, see, Sean, would you raise your hand in the back? See him. He's got a job opportunity. Uh, so, hey, isn't that awesome? Yeah. Work comes looking for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know some of you probably saying I wish it wouldn't look so hard. <laughs> but God's blessing. So please make sure you see him if you're interested in that. And uh, what better way to work for a good Christian employer? Uh, that's awesome. And we're really blessed in this local church. This afternoon or this evening, probably more. Uh, those of you that would like to uh, canvas some of the neighborhood hand out little flyers for VBS tomorrow. Rachel will be in the back part of the church area. Please see her and she'll coordinate with her and uh, we still have some work to do. I need a couple young men, strong, uh, that can help them set up some last minute things for uh, the VBS tomorrow. So if a couple of you young, strong men can be here and that will make a big, big, big difference. Uh, other than that, make sure you see Rachel. Uh, tomorrow uh, at uh, 6.30 uh, is our BBS. And uh, so uh, invite uh, the neighborhood kids, and we're going to have a fantastic time. You can see the enormous work that has been in our lives. Uh, I, I, I'm holding back from calling out the names, because I'll do that toward the end of uh, BBS and recognize everyone, make sure they're all here. But, boy, there's a few names I can give a shout-out to right now and say, it would not have been possible. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you guys outdid it. And uh, we thank you so much. And we'll recognize everyone at the end of the, uh, at the BBS. So Mark, come and finish this. We decree. We decree. Him. Yeah. Lakers. 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 Oh. Oh. This whole world. Oh. Oh. Every child that, and man, woman that comes to this building this week. Yeah.